This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Moeller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. James Davidson Hunter is the LeBros Levinson Distinguished Professor of Religion, Culture, and Social Theory at the University of Virginia, where he also serves as Executive Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. He received his baccalaureate degree in sociology from Gordon College, Master of Arts and PhD in sociology from Rutgers University. It is his most recent book, Democracy and Solidarity on the Cultural Roots of America's Political Crisis. That book is the topic of our conversation today. Professor Hunter, welcome to Thinking in Public. Thank you very much. So happy to be here. Well, you know, I'm kind of in the unusual position of saying that uh, we, we've been in conversation uh, for the last 40 or uh, 40 plus years, but it's really been mostly one way with you writing the books and uh, then uh, me uh, greatly appreciating your writings and frankly, uh, uh, engaging with so many of your ideas. I think back to 1983, your first book, American Evangelicalism, Conservative mm-hmm. Religion and the Quandary of Modernity. And I was a doctoral student at the time, and I have to tell you, I I was deeply grappling with my own version of the quandary of modernity, and uh, and ever since then, quite frankly, uh, you've been uh, you've been one of the most uh, I think uh, catalytic minds uh, in American intellectual life. So I just want to say thank you. Well, thanks. That's very generous coming from you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I uh, I I think through categories that you have given uh, Americans in terms of uh, intellectual categories, uh, and, and such as cognitive bargaining, which we'll talk about at some point, because uh, <laughs> I, even as I was working in theological method, that's exactly what I was seeing, and uh, I think that really came out uh, pretty clearly in your second book about younger evangelicals. But you know, um, you rocked the intellectual world in the United States with your book entitled Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America, which was 1991. And uh, so you're you're one of the few people to have coined a term such as culture war. And uh, now in your latest book, Democracy and Solidarity on the Cultural Roots of America's Political Crisis, in in one sense, I I think you've come back to ask some of the most uh, important questions, and in some cases to ask them again. Is that fair to say? It is. Yeah, this is... uh... This new book is a bookend to the yeah. uh, earlier book, Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America. It's in part because so much has changed since the early 1990s when I published the book, and late 1980s when I was researching and writing it. But but um, but also my thinking has, I think, become a little bit more sophisticated. I, um, I was a younger man when I wrote that first book. And um, I have continued to read and continue to learn. And I wanted to bring that to bear on providing what I think is, and I hope is, a more more nuanced understanding of the very complicated challenge that we face. Well, you know, I was involved in uh, a good many conversations prompted by the Culture Wars book in 1991. I, uh, the, the, one of the first things that happened, I was uh, in a symposium at Emory University and uh, then at the Chautauqua Institution and other places because you really set the, uh, the conversational flame pretty high there. And, and by the way, what you described in that book is what I was seeing and experiencing. But the other thing I experienced was the, the, the blowback to your book with people saying that you were imagining something that wasn't there, the, this basic yeah. divide at the most fundamental level of morality and, and frankly, reality, ontology, metaphysics, that right. separated Americans. You were really charged back in the early 1990s with exaggerating and, uh, quite frankly, uh, bringing a kind of a, an unnecessary belligerence uh, to the cultural equation. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I think the first 15 years after that book was published, I was doing, um, I was in an ongoing debate with my colleagues in political science, sociology, um, political theory, and elsewhere. Um, Did this thing exist? Did it not? And I came to the conclusion that the, um, actually, you know, the very first uh, 
public presentation. It was an author meets critic event um, and a very senior social theorist uh, from very sophisticated uh, man said, there is no culture war. It's a mopping up campaign. And, you know, it was off, it was off from there. And I, I came to the conclusion that the the denial of the culture war, the denial of, of something that was just so really apparent to almost everyone else except for uh, um, many of those in, in uh, the social sciences, that the denial of the culture war was in fact an act in the culture war to deny the culture war is to essentially say that the other side doesn't matter. Right. You know, that's exactly what I felt in particular uh, when I spoke uh, in uh, the context of the Chautauqua institution, that's a pretty liberal audience and that's an understatement, but uh, I was the only contributor to that conversation invited to be there uh, who had any connection uh, to a conservative side of, of the culture. And, and they treated me as if I were a National Geographic specimen. Sure. And you you speak of the mopping up operation. I can just tell you that was one of the first times I was in a cultural context, and it, it was in the early 90s. It, it was the first time I was in a context in which it was clear that the folks who were presenting with me didn't even find the discussion interesting. It was just so over. Right. And uh, I, I, I don't know how they have rethought the equation. Some of them are probably old enough they haven't much. But, but you, you know, your thesis it has not only not been disproved, I, I mean, obviously you would probably modify it now in many ways. That's why you wrote this book. But, I mean, no one can really deny there has been a culture war in this country for the last generation or more. Well, I think it's it's not unlike the great secularization theory um, yeah. about the with modernity comes a decline in uh, religion. And I think that was wishful thinking for many, many generations of secular scholars. There, there is some empirical uh, validity to the argument, but in its nuance. But this this general notion that religion is simply going to disappear and we're going to uh, live in an uncomplicated secular world, um, it's taken a long time for secular scholars to realize it's not going away. And I think in the same res- in, in the same sense. Um, the culture war has only intensified. It is um, the animosities are are, are deeper, and um, and I think the main problem is that um, main. I I would say most are not grappling with the nature of the culture in culture war deeply enough. Um, to understand why it is that it's now within our DNA um, as as a uh, as a nation, and that it's not going away. This is not simply happening. Um, I oftentimes use the metaphor of the weather and the climate. This is not just happening on the at, at the right. in the patterns of the weather. This is deeply climatological, and it will continue. Um, uh, I'm sure yeah. for generations to come. Yeah, I, I'm I'm convinced you're right. I, I want to go back uh, to the late '80s when you're doing this research, and um, and the early '90s when it landed, because it kind of sets the stage for uh, our conversation to follow. What were you seeing in the culture that led you to uh, you know kind of appropriate that German noun culture comp um, uh, from uh, Wilhelmine Germany? Uh, and and say, well, that's what's happening in the United States. And and, and I'd ask you at the same time to I- I explain why now your your uh, use of uh, modernity is absolutely crucial here. I think so. Why in the United States and why now? <laughs> well, that's a very big question. Um, so I was um, I was a student of the the great Austrian emigre scholar Peter Berger. Um, and I was trained in the sociology of knowledge, sociology of religion. Uh, the sociology of culture was not really named uh, that at, at, at the time. And there's a lot I could say. Uh, Peter was one of the most brilliant people I had 
ever met and um and great fun to work with uh, but peter didn't really have a theory of power um he had a theory of legitimation he had he was brilliant in so many ways but but large scale cultural religious conflict really wasn't part of the the matrix of of his thought and you know in 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 freudian language we kill the father um uh we we find out what in our mentors uh um um paradigm is missing and you and you want to fill the gap and and part of uh this is also i think on the heels of my having written to um uh, books on American evangelicalism and trying to figure out how it is that um, against the supposed backdrop of secularization, how is it possible that a uh, religious orthodoxy not only survives but thrives? How in the world is that, how does that make sense and how do we make sense of that? And, and um, what happened in the late 1980s is that I was uh, doing a research project uh, on uh, religious authority, um, and it involved a big survey of, of elites, business elites, media elites, academic elites, and religious elites in Germany, England, and the United States. And when I was beginning to analyze the data, I found that, that Orthodox Jews, conservative Catholics, and evangelical and fundamentalist Protestants had more in common with each other than they did with those in their own tradition, but on the other side of the cultural divide. And this happened about the same time that I read a story in the New York Post about a, a, a protest at an abortion clinic, I think a Planned Parenthood clinic in, in Midtown Manhattan, in which... Um, an Orthodox rabbi and a couple of congregants, along with um, uh, a, a group of nuns, uh, priests, a monsignor, and about a dozen or so evangelical ministers and um, were protesting together, side by side, uh, arm in arm, and were arrested together at that protest. And if you know anything about the history of Western civilization, you know about the, the prominence of anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism. The 19th century and the United States was rife with anti-Catholicism. And, and yet, here they are, standing shoulder to shoulder um, uh, and being arrested together uh, um, in common cause. What is the dynamic that's making this historically unprecedented gathering possible? And, and it was, again, reinforced by the uh, data that I was analyzing. And of course, I found that it was true on the other side of the cultural divide, that progressive Catholics, liberal Protestants, and reform and secular Jewish elites were also forming alliances that were stronger with each other than they were with their members of their own religious tradition and theological tradition. So this was historically unprecedented, and it 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 traced back to the issue of the good, which is the heart of culture itself. Um, what is the good, and how do we know it? And what they all, what the conservative. Uh, of uh, leaders of these different traditions all shared in common is the belief that we know the good um, through transcendent sources. It could be the magisterium, it could be uh, the authoritative scriptures, or it could be Torah. But these are not constructions of our own. We don't just make these things up. They are objective truths as they are experienced and, and seen. And on the other side, uh, all of the sources of authority that were shared in common were um, an understanding of the moral good of truth and so on from worldly, uh, whether science or subjective experience. So um, that's how I knew that this was not going away. Um, anything that touches on uh, cultural authority even if it's never articulated fully, um, was going to have staying power. It was not 
just ephemeral um, um, uh, political action on the part of some hotheads on either side of the cultural divide. This is this is pointing to something deeper and more enduring. Yeah, when I uh, talk about these things with uh, graduate students, I often say that all you have to do is look at the 1960 and the 1980 editions of the uh, two-party platforms, and you'll see the conversation has shifted from marginal tax rates to the meaning of life. That's right. And, and something had to have happened, but you know, between 1960 and 1980. Well, that's that's exactly right. As I've often said, most of the political conflict of the 20th century happened along a continuum that was mainly defined by the terms of political economy. It was about corporations versus labor unions. It was about uh, uh, the managerial class and the working class. Um, it was about you know, the way it was constructed, oftentimes uh, the wealthy versus the poor. And that really defined the terms of being left or being right, how you positioned yourself. Well, again, in this period of the late 1970s into the 1980s, um, but certainly with roots that are earlier than that, um, the very meaning of the words left and right, conservative and progressive, were changing to reflect these cultural dynamics rather than these uh, the dynamics of political economy. So you wrote the book. You, uh, you, you declared the reality of the culture war, explained it within the intellectual context and the cultural context of such rapid change in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and then ensued some controversy. You kind of doubled down in 1994 with your book, Before the Shooting Begins, uh, Searching for Democracy in America's Culture War. And uh, I remember a line from that book uh, going all the way back uh, to, uh, to the 1990s. You said that not all culture wars turn into shooting wars, but virtually all shooting wars begin as a culture war. Yeah, for sure. That's still true. So, right. So, so spell, that, spell that out a bit for us. So in other words, uh, you know, I, I, I think most readers are going to be able to say, well, okay, I, I see that in general, but how does that play out, you know, in, in terms of the culture war here? Well, first of all, the, the basic proposition I think is undoubtedly true. Uh, culture, all culture wars precede shooting wars. Um, and that doesn't mean a shooting war will inevitably um, uh, come about. But you never have a shooting war without a prior culture war, and for the very simple reason that culture provides the justifications for violence. Right. War is Cult conflict over something. That's right. And, and, and its meanings and the meaning that we impute to, um, to our interests, to our ideals, to the things that we're fighting over. So um, – and from 1830 to – the eight, early 1860s, there was a 30-year culture war over the meaning of black humanity. And um, in a nation that was not only divided theologically and um, culturally over black humanity, but also regionally. And, um, you know, there's much to say about that, but in in a nation that was divided over something as deep as as this, there was an at, uh, several attempts to achieve a compromise, uh, which each time made matters worse, not better. Then uh, the Supreme Court in nineteen in eighteen fifty seven um, uh, ruled um, that uh, in a majority decision written by uh, Justice Roger Taney that that um, that in fact the founders of the republic intended black humanity to be less than white humanity. It affirmed the legitimacy of a slave regime. Um, it was an attempt to impose consensus through the power of the state. And the, um, the result was three years later, we were at war. And war essentially brought about another consensus through the power of the state. Um, 
And and obviously, in my opinion, um, the right side won, but it, it came at an extraordinary cost, and it was far less effective than anyone imagined. Um, there are two points I want to make here. One is that culture wars tend to be bloody. Um, they tend to become um, violent when we see the other side as less than human. Um, when our conception of the other side is that these people are um, are not members of the political community and worthy of its protections as well as its privileges, then it seems to me the other side or whoever is in power um, has the justifications for doing whatever they want um, to the other side. I mean, this is, of course, what happened um, in in um, in the 1930s in Nazi Germany. Um, the first step um, toward the Holocaust was simply denying uh, Jews citizenship and the rights and privileges and protections that citizenship provided. Um, then it was possible to essentially do whatever you wanted. So when there is a and you, by the way, you see this in the in the Bosnia, Bosnian conflict. You've seen this in African conflicts. When the culture war finally settles on who is a member of the community and worthy of its protections and who is outside of the boundaries, um, that's when things get awful. And um, during the 1990s, I think part of the reason why people weren't worried was because it was mainly a white middle class conflict. The economy is doing pretty well. People are, uh, it, it, it was a middle class conflict, some class divisions, but not much. But it was, um, it was contained by those things. All of a sudden in 2008, the, um, there is now a class dimension and the life chances of of one side of this cultural divide were were threatened. And I, I I'm quite sure that that's one of the reasons things intensified at that moment. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's interesting it, you make that point because uh, I, I, I have not only uh, uh, been in intellectual engagement with your works, but I, I also over the years have uh, ordered and read every symposium I've seen uh, on your thesis on culture war. And I think there was one, I believe it was the Brookings Institution. It's been a while, but it, it, there was a chapter, I think, by Alan Wolf, in which he basically said, if there was a culture war, it's, kind of, it, it, it's over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, looking back at it, you can go, wow, how can you miss? And, and I, I, I respect uh, Professor Wolf. I, I, I'm just saying it's, it's one of those things you just look at it and you go, so how? How could you say that? From where I live, it would have been impossible to say that yeah. the conflict is receding rather than advancing. And so it, it, it's kind of a humbling thing to read because I thought, you know, we're inhabiting two different worlds here. We were at a, um, an event sponsored by the late Mike Cromarty. I don't know if you knew mm -hmm. Mike. Sure. Um, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and um, and the debate was in front of a group of about 25 different journalists. And so Alan and I went head to head on it and we made our cases. Eventually it became published, as you know. But but in the context of that debate with all of these journalists, there wasn't a single journalist there who is uh, taking Alan's side. It was. Uh, yeah, I, I, they were seeing it day to day. They were writing about it. Um, that was my perception. So, right. But well, Alan you know, is, is, is a yeah. Yeah, you think good about man. The time. Thoughtful man, but we were very uh, on yeah. different sides of that one. And I think, um, I think I I came out on the, on that one. Well, I I, I think uh, undoubtedly, but I, I I do appreciate the fact that there was a conversation like that because, quite frankly, in that kind of context, that dynamic, you 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 have arguments refined and. Uh, and, and you know it's it's also important for me to know, and for listeners of this program to know, that uh, there are people, and I, I I don't mean this dismissively, but elites in the culture where, quite honestly, they don't meet anyone who isn't in basic agreement with their worldview. Um, 
and they don't understand what it is like to be on the underside of these changes, uh, which, which means, you know, if, if you have the Supreme Court and the Roe decision, you know, legalizing abortion and, and, and you're on the conservative pro-life side, and then uh, you, uh, you have the Obergefell decision in 2015, you know, so far as one part of our society is thinking, well, this is just inevitable. This is progress, Hegelian, you know, unfolding of history and spirit. On the other hand, there's a sense, okay, our challenge is greater than we ever knew. But um, I appreciate those uh, on the other side of the conflict who, quite frankly, are are engaged in honest conversation. And I've, 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 I've had the privilege of those conversations. But I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's very unbalanced in the sense that, you know, I have to be very familiar with their stuff and read it constantly. Uh, they really don't need to follow our stuff very much in the world in which they live. I, I you know, the the world of of higher education is, for the most part, a monoculture. Um, and it's not uniformly so. There are lots of people who are um, I mean, I would say the majority of scholars in, in the world I inhabit are honest, hardworking, um, but it, it's, um, and, 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 and truth seekers. Um, but there are very powerful scripts, um, that dominate the space that we live in. And I, I think it is often dangerous for people to offer an alternative perspective um, if they want to enjoy the benefits of career mobility, um, right. there's a certain kind of conformity yeah. that's expected. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, when there was that uh, first round of uh, pretty massive uh, uh, conflict on the campus of Columbia University uh, going back nearly 20 years ago, and uh, a prominent Jewish family put together a program and a fund. Uh, they've been in the headlines recently on the same campus because of similar reasons. I was one of the persons invited to uh, to be a part of that symposium uh, there in the low library at Columbia. The president of, of Columbia very uh, skillfully, you know, supervised the uh, the discussion and the symposium. And, uh, you know, at the end of it, I all of a sudden realized, again, I I... I am stepping into a world where, honestly, they never hear anything like this from on campus. And I say that because that's what they said. <laughs> that's, that's what they said to me. You they know, not only this is heard it, new. they don't know yeah. anyone like you. Yeah. Yeah. People, you know, someone like you are just not part of the diversity that they want or yeah. that they, and I've heard that, frankly, many times. And and frankly, from both sides, um, sure, that, which is part of the problem we're facing right. right now. Right, uh, th thus your book. Uh, but your your yeah. latest book, "Democracy and Solidarity: On the Cultural Roots of America's Political Crisis." I I have to say, uh, I picked it up wondering what you were going to do, and I have to tell you, it was an incredibly uh, satisfying uh, engagement when I I sat down with your book. And uh, and I think perhaps particularly uh, important to me because I do go all the way back to 1983 in your American Evangelicalism Project and follow through. And so I, I want to say, first of all, uh, uh, just as a statement of, uh, of academic amazement, uh, I don't think there's really anyone who's written anything important about this that you haven't engaged. And uh, so I, I'm one of those rare people that uh, just cannot read the book without reading the footnotes. Well, good and, for and you. That's right. So I was going back and forth the whole time and uh, making all my marks. But I'm I'm, I'm going to suggest to you. I I came to the conclusion in reading your book that what you have done here is to take the culture wars thesis, and it's not just expand it and reflect upon it. It seems to me you've dug underneath it, excavated a bit, and yeah. and pointed to something perhaps even more foundational than you saw uh, with the culture wars book in 1991. Is that fair? That is completely fair. And it's a great metaphor. So thanks for that. But I might use it now. So, sure. but, um, but yeah, I did. I, I, again, just to go back to the distinction between the weather and the climate, we are generally focused on what has happened this week or today or the past month. And, um, and we engage public issues in that way. And, um, 
and yeah, I I wanted to dig even deeper and. I know this is fairly esoteric for the average reader, but um, you would appreciate, I think, that um, this rather bold statement, which isn't made in academic social science, um, I, I don't think ever, but that implicit within every institution, every society, every civilization, um, our answers to the question, what is real, what is true, how do we know who is a member of the community and worthy of its protections, how do we treat other people, and what is the point of it all, where is it all going? And these are all proto-philosophical questions that no one ever fully articulates and may, I would say, 99% are not even aware that they're answering these questions, but they are there. And when you start digging it into the substructure of uh, uh, American civilization, you find that um, there is this rich, complex um, story that's unfolding. And, um, and that's really the story I'm trying to tell of how we went to from a, a rather opaque consensus around those kinds of questions to a place where it seems like we're giving up on those questions altogether and we are now just engaged in a kind of competing will to power. It's just about who's going to win this. Yeah. People are giving up. So well, I'm tempted to jump to the end of the book, but I'm not going to do that. No, so no, let me just can. walk through it a bit here. Sure. Um, you uh, you use some categories you've used before, uh, such as cultural logics, and uh, yeah. so you know. In in summary, this is are, are these always conscious or, or or are these logics largely unconscious? Uh, you know what the, the, what makes this society work? And I, I appreciate the fact you're pressing back to say, okay, so how in the world does this happen? How does this idea emerge? Well, surface and depth, weather and climate are related to each other. Um, so. You, we can understand the cultural logics of of a group or of a party or of a faction, to use the old fashioned language, um, by virtue of what they say and and the patterns of what is said again and again and again. But um, but culture is not just about the text that we can read or see or observe. It's also about the context and the subtext. And so part of what I'm trying to do in, in understanding the implicit cultural logics is to try to understand the subtext. You know, I'll, I'll just use an example um, of conspiracy theories. I, I, I find it almost hilarious at this point, and privately hilarious, when the Washington Post or the New York Times lists the long um, uh, list of, of lies that President Trump has uttered. Um, and then they provide documentation for um, why they are lies and how they are untrue and, and the evidence that would demonstrate all of that. And, and you know, that's a, that, I suppose that's a worthy exercise. We should be held accountable to the things that we're saying. But at the level of a cultural logic, a cultural logic is not a, a, um, a philosophical or scientific logic. A cultural logic is about the meaning that we make. Cultural logics are a, primarily about meaning. So a conspiracy theory or the kinds of things that a president will say that are wildly inaccurate aren't so much about accuracy as they are about um, a, a narrative of what is meaningful to his audience, his or her audience. So, um, yeah, truth has actually very little to do with it. Um, it's not the text, it's the subtext. And, um, yeah, so it's it's important to, to sort of read things at different levels. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I think it's applicable, uh, actually, to trying to understand any cultures actually pretty necessary and uh, it might be easier to see in 
cultures of which we're not so much apart than the ones of which we are. Yeah, I think that's uh, right. Because we just we we swim in this water. Um, about uh, uh, I don't know, hundred pages in your book or so. Uh, you're you're really dealing with the uh, the secular reality and the and the shift. And so you do several things. You have these these big concepts that I think are so important. And and you also have a narrative, and you you come back to it. And and I'll say you punctuate the narrative with uh, with the uh, conflict. Uh, and you you make me want to see a debate between Richard John Newhouse and Lawrence Tribe. Uh, they're, yeah, they're, right. So far as I know, it never happened except in your book. <laughs> but uh, I, I would love to have seen it. Richard John Newhouse was a friend. And uh, but uh, but going back to this, it, uh, uh, just a few chapters into your book, you deal with the the shift into a more secular context in the United States. And you use a couple of categories I found very interesting. And one of them may be attributable to Henry May. Um, you speak of ideas understood religiously. Yeah. And, and uh, later you talk about uh, the secularization of uh, Protestantism and the Enlightenment, in which you say that the synthesis was basically doing the work of religion. And I, I found those two sentences very powerful because I think that's exactly the way I see what took place, especially in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is a, American society at that time was a time uh, in when it's elites in particular, less ordinary citizens, but it's certainly it's elites were uh, secularizing very, very quickly. Uh, religion as a source of authority, especially over issues of public policy had lost a lot of ground and um of, of of course you know the the interactions between the united states and england france germany in the intellectual realm um there's so much um stimulating thought and influences just swirling around and um and I would say that the because the deep structures of American civilization had been so um, suffused with religion that as um, our society is making this pivot toward a secular society, its intellectuals are still wanting to address they understand that the religious questions are still there, but they are somehow unable to address them religiously but um or through explicit theological language so they are in, in a way providing answers to um these questions um because they know that those questions are still being asked they they are still part of the of of the web and the fabric of of the civilization and that they Ordinary people want answers to that. So there's enormous pressure. I mean, it's just a very quick illustration. Um, American sociology versus, say, French sociology. French sociology becomes, and German sociology, becomes very, very uh, secular very quickly at the end of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. But in the United States, Sociology is mainly in, in, in those early decades is dominated by the sons of ministers who are wanting to address the problems of poverty and of drunkenness and of of um, of of uh, immigration, and they are doing it in ways that are just very religiously oriented. They want to solve problems. But anyway, well, you know, um, I, I don't come to this question as a sociologist, but as a theologian. Right. right. And so I, I want to ask the sociologist, so it, it, is it possible to pivot a society that was so suffused uh, with religious meaning? And, and not only that, as, as you're honest to say, it's basically Protestant. The fusion you talk about is a fusion between Protestantism and the Enlightenment. Yeah, is it yeah. possible for that pivot to be made? I guess first of all, without massive conflict, and and then secondly, um, 
and there remained continuity with the with the the society as it as it began. I mean, obviously, I'm a theologian. My answer to that is no. But I, I I'm I'd be curious how the sociologists would answer this. Well, I think the pivot took place first among elites. Um, it did not take place among ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens in the early part of the 20th century, right through the early um, uh, the post-World War II period, are still going to church in massive numbers. Um, uh, they are still, if not creedally bound, they are culturally bound to the traditions of uh, of a um, a Jewish and Christian um, uh, world view. Um, but it, that's just harder and harder to sustain. And I think sort of what's happened from the 1960s is that a larger higher education became a carrier of secularization. So in the post-World War II period is much larger numbers of the American population are going to colleges and universities, getting their degrees. At the same time uh, that they're getting credentialed, they're also becoming much, much more secular in their orientation. So, um, but, you know, um, I, I think all of the questions that theology asks um, are, are questions that are at the heart of every civilization, whether they are answered in a religious uh, voice or a secular voice. And, and those very hard questions are, what is the meaning of life? How, how do I make sense of suffering? Is there a point to human action? Is it, or is it all meaningless? These are theological questions, philosophical questions, obviously, too. Um, and those don't go away once a pivot has taken place. So even in the early decades of the 21st century, um, we are asking those questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, as I look at, at, at the three books, uh, Culture War, 91, Before the Shooting Starts, I think, 94, uh, or Before the Shooting Begins. And, and then uh, the, your, your latest work, which is 2024, you know, I, I look at it and I want to say, okay, um, in this book, uh, the, the, the third in that series, uh, you write with some very real concern uh, uh, about how in the world uh, this, uh, this experiment in the United States can continue. And uh, and so I think one of the very helpful things you do is, for instance, you know, put side by side a Richard John Newhouse, whom you see as kind of a threat uh, from the right, uh, particularly in the First Thing Symposium. Um, it, that's that particular symposium, sure. Right, right. And 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 uh, in, in other words, it's questioning I don't whether think democracy. Him personally, is... I think some of the things no. that were there. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, he's a dear friend. So I, I yeah, I, I, I did not mean that in a personal sense. But I mean, you, you know, and then Lawrence Tribe. Um, and then eventually Richard Rorty, you know, with the complete denial of natural law and frankly, the denial of ontology in one sense. Uh, I guess the, the question I want to ask is, is that if you go back to 1991, did you see things headed at such a fundamental level? Uh, you, you know, uh, you were writing before most Americans were talking about postmodernism, you know, anti-realism, you know, et cetera. Uh, but boy, we're in the thick of it. Look, I I think that the the interesting story is a story that's told at the level of our DNA. And that's really what this concept of the deep structures of culture is trying to get at. And I think if we understand something about the DNA and how that DNA is being modified or changing, um, it seems to me that we can we're not going to be able to make any specific predictions by a long shot. And sociologists are have a terrible record at predicting uh, uh, the future. But I do believe that if we understand something about the DNA, we can we will understand how these cultural logics will unfold. And um, I think that the cultural logic right now is not drawing so much from the hybrid enlightenment. Um, cultures like everything else abhor a vacuum. And I think what has filled the vacuum are the cultural logics of nihilism. Mm 
Yeah. And so you you surprised it, me with where you where you go with that. And I'm going to tell you uh, how you surprised. Uh, so uh, I'm not at all surprised that in the last third of the book you would get to the the grave threats facing our uh, uh, our, our social experiment, our constitutional republic. Right. And uh, and you identify threats on the left, and uh, you identify threats on the right, mm-hmm. and then you have this unexpected uh, section on uh, the uh, dangers from America's deep structures. <laughs> that I did not see coming, mm-hmm. and I appreciate it because I I, I I understand what you're doing there. I think, but uh, I mean these are questions that uh, you know continental intellectuals were asking in the early 19th century about the United States. Right. Well, you know, part of it just came from uh, observations uh, made years and years ago, decades ago, early in my career, when I realized as I was watching, especially on the left, um, the, the movements of of social and political movements on the left, that the, the idea of Puritan perfectionism had survived its secularization. And um, and as it turns out, they continue to be true. There is, there are purity tests um, that we see um, not only on the right, in you know, in the ways that our um, Christian forebears have been mocked and um, derided, but we we see purity tests on the left just as much. So the idea of a kind of America uh, as a city on a hill has survived its secularization. And I think perfectionism, uh, if I can use an eschatological, I mean, a theological term, I think as is, is, is dangerous uh, eschatologically. It's uh, insofar as, as we human beings live on this side of the veil, um, any press toward perfection uh, or at least expectation that we can achieve perfection is bound to be disappointed. Uh, so, so now what, you, you know, and, and you come to the, the concluding section of your book, and I just wish we could walk through so many of the dimensions of, uh, of your analysis, but just coming kind, of, kind of summarize them. At, okay. Now we come to the end and uh, you didn't write this book merely as a dispassionate observer. You obviously care deeply. So, so, so now what? Yeah. Well, I believe that the culture war is at a point where I would describe it as um, I would describe it as warring hegemonic projects. These are um, the culture war is now about domination. It is about coercing um, solidarity, unity. Um, uh, rather than achieving it democratically through serious, substantive engagement with the other side. Uh, every institution, every society, uh, a family, as a, the most basic institution, requires some basis of agreement, some solidarity. And if it cannot be generated organically, it will be imposed coercively by force. And I think that's really where we are right now as a nation. I believe that um, at the extremes of of, uh, the culture war, uh, people have given up debate. They've given up the process. I mean, look, at the end of the day, and I've said this for many years now, whatever else democracy is, it is uh, an agreement not to kill each other over our differences but rather to talk those things through. And even if we don't get what we want, uh, we will find ways to compromise with each other. Um, and But no one's interested in compromise right now. I also think um, that in addition to the activists um, in this culture war, essentially no longer interested in debate, dialogue, engagement, I also think that at the extremes, we have seen an evolution of of the left and the right in ways that no longer are less recognizable to their historical roots. Um, and, And so what we end up with 
on the ends is are is in a liberal um there are illiberal progressives and there are illiberal conservatives there are liberal pro, uh, progressives and liberal conservatives in the middle each side views the other as the extreme so no one sees any nuance here and um the middle which by which i mean um, not a fixed point on a political continuum, but those who are still committed to the American project and uh, willing to have that conversation, the middle no longer has a mailing list. They're not mobilized. And as a consequence, it is it is the extremes of our uh, of our culture war that dominate our public yeah. debate. And um, of course, that's driven even uh, further uh, to the extremes by algorithms and the new technologies of, of communication and so on. So this is a real mess. I, I wrote the book in part to understand the full measure of the crisis that we're in. And until we understand exactly fully and well what the problem is, it's going to be very hard uh, to see yeah. an alternative way. Let me uh, around. press back, back just a bit uh, and ask you, uh, where yeah. is that middle? And 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 so this is just one, one thing that strikes me. And 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 I think I think you you have to discuss this at, 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 at least to some degree in 1991 in the Culture Wars book. But uh, but in in this book, I I came to the end thinking, you know, we're driven by these cultural logics, and yeah. uh, and and you know, if you have a deep ontological theological commitment on one side, and you have a, a an opposing moral commitment, which is anti ontological and anti theological on the other side, and uh, and you look at a binary, and I don't just mean in the election. I mean increasingly, yeah. you know, every country club and retailer is a part of the binary. Yeah. Um, you, you know, in other words, where where is that middle? I I don't think I preach to it on on many Sundays. I think I used to. Oh, right. uh, but I don't think I do anymore. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I think a lot of them are simply opting out of public life. I think they're, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think people are, 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 are weary and life is complicated enough. Just keeping a family together, keeping enough money flowing through to, to pay one's bills. It, Life's just tough. And yeah, I think people are just opting out. I, I see a lot of that in survey data as well as an anecdotal experience. Um, and the people who are still opting into that debate are the ones who are finding meaning in a way um, uh, in that engagement. Um, and they're not always the most thoughtful people. I think this is especially true uh, within uh, the leadership class. Our, I think our, our political elites, um, not just the well-known representatives in the Senate and, and the House, but our policymakers and so on, are, it's a kind of take-no-prisoners approach. Um, uh, to these kinds of issues, and yeah, well, I mean, so just to be concrete in that, uh, most uh, members of Congress are far more concerned with being primaried than to being defeated in a general exactly. election. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, that's right. It, it's that's pushing right. every argument uh, further and further, and and I don't say that just as if it's a part of some sinister plot. Uh, I want to say sympathetically, I think that's a part of what happens in the pressure cooker of the late modern age when. I mean, honestly, the trajectory of everything is, for anyone with eyes open, pretty clear. Uh, and, and so, you know, you come down to fundamental issues such as the definition of marriage, uh, the, the definition of life. I, it's, it's really harder to imagine a consensus. I'm not, I'm not saying culturally it's impossible, but I'm saying, you know, the, there, there is no pressure towards consensus when, I, I mean, for instance, just you take the last, to say, 24 hours, and, and as we're having this discussion, this is a headline news with the second anniversary of, of the Dobbs decision. Um, I, I, I think what strikes me is that in the distance between Roe v. Wade in 1973 and the Dobbs decision in, in uh, 2022, 
I think far more Americans understand, okay, this is where that cultural, this is where that moral logic leads. This is, this is, this is where this heads. This is why this is important. And I, I guess in my stage of life, um, I just say that that's just a fundamental difference. I think America in Roe uh, in 1973 is a different America than uh, with Dobbs in 2022. I, I think it is. I think that's right. And again, I think the reason why abortion has been the longest standing issue of the culture war and the most vehemently battled is precisely because it is over these fundamental proto-philosophical yeah. questions. And they won't go away. The problem is, of course, that law can't do the work of culture. That's the problem. Um, it, That's worth repeating. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, law, repeat it, and, and, and then uh, please explain. Uh, sure. The, the, the law cannot making. do the work of culture. Yeah. There's a culture war that preceded the Civil War. Neither the Supreme Court nor the Civil War settled it. And as a consequence, the slave regime was reproduced under the name of the KKK, uh, Jim Crow, Code Noir, lynching, and the like. It was simply reproduced because law didn't touch these questions at a cultural, at a deep cultural level. The same is true with Roe versus Wade. A consensus was imposed upon the nation in 1973 with the Roe v. Wade decision for a nation that had not talked about it, worked it through, sorted it out, and really had serious and substantive engagement with each other. And as a consequence, the pro-life movement came to life, started looking for workarounds, and 50 years later, it's overturned with another Supreme Court decision. And what are progressives doing? Exactly the same thing, looking for workarounds, because law cannot do the work of culture. We think it's going to solve things, and it won't. So, yeah, you know, that gets you know, to the whole. One of the things yeah. I think would have helped mm -hmm. um, the pro life movement um, is, is, you know, and it, this is something I suggested even in a book I wrote called To Change the World. Um, legal strategies are fine. They're democratically acceptable and legitimate. But why not take some of the resources in a, to, in a state like Illinois or New York or California, really solidly pro-choice states, and get a petition with 10,000 families willing to adopt a child of any race, ethnic background, uh, capacity, and then announce to the on the state at the state capitol that there are no unwanted children in uh, the state of Illinois or New York or California. Um, instead of the coercive power of the state, the pro life movement would be leading with with an act of sacrificial love. And I think more of that would have changed in a way the temper and tone might have. Change some of the temper and tone. I don't know. Yeah, I, I hear that. I I, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, with some others, respond to your book, um, uh, To Change the World. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I did not appreciate that one as much as the others, partly because I am involved in these issues, including yes. in the pro-life movement. And I just want to say, I was, I, I was on the board of an organization, national organization, that sought uh, to do uh, exactly what you're discussing, not either or. Uh, and, yeah. and we got basically shut down by the bureaucracies in in those states uh, who, yeah. who, who, you know, frank, frankly, um, I, I, I hear that that word. I just want to say that uh, I, I, I think here's the wonderful thing about Christians. I, I, I find that Christians are generally very ready to do the right thing yeah. uh, if they have the opportunity. But even as recently as, you know, this very day, I've been in a conversation in which, uh, you know, that that particular issue, that specific issue has gone very badly because of, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, government in interference. But the yeah. point is, I don't is doubt made. that either. I don't doubt that. I, I, I appreciate the point you're making as being a very legitimate word. And that sets me up to, to want to conclude by asking you sure. to go back to 1983, not just to 1991. Yeah. And uh, so uh, obviously you didn't stop thinking about and caring about American evangelicals and the quandary of modernity. We're in a deeper <laughs> quandary now. 
And uh, as someone who's president of a of, of an evangelical institution, and uh, and, and uh, you know, for whom the evangelical world is 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 my people uh, yeah, uh, right. beyond Southern Baptists, I just want to ask. Okay, so, so what would you say to us now? Because uh, I think you had your finger on the pulse of uh, of what was then the coming generation, that generation's grandparents now. Uh, yeah. So how would you update that argument? Well, you know, I would argue that um, what I didn't quite see then in 1983, I was a 20—well, uh, I had written that as my dissertation, and I was about 25 years old at the time, so I'm going to give myself a little bit of a break there. Uh, I didn't see it then. I see it clearly now, that the ground underneath our feet as a nation— certainly as a developed world, and certainly as a people of faith, that ground has shifted underneath our feet. And most people don't understand the nature of the changes from a period of high modernity, which was a confidence in reason, confidence in science, confidence in progress, to a late modern moment in which truth has been deconstructed, um uh you know ethics has simply been relativized um it, yeah where where we can't even answer the question of what is true right real good and no one can make those claims with any authority anymore in ways that would be accepted by a plurality. Um, so that means that if we are in a new world, if we are, in a, in a way, many Christians want to believe we are still in a, a largely Christian-inflected world. And I think that we're not only in a post-Christian world, we are in a post-liberal and post-enlightenment world. I think we are seeing the contours of a, a Nietzschean world. Um, that's my fundamental conviction. And it seems to me that the cultural logics of that world are so deeply embedded in the culture forming institutions of our society. And that's a really important statement because the dominant cultural forming institutions um, are not moving backward. And really, the only resources that cultural conservatives have um, left are political resources. And that's why Governor DeSantis intervenes at the University of Florida and on many of in, in the area of the arts, you know, most recently, um, and so on. It's because th these are resources available to conservatives. But influencing, um, you know, elite higher education is just, that's the project of, a, of 150 years, and that's not going to happen right. anytime soon. So um, there's no going backward. And I think so we have to come to terms, believers have to come to terms with a post-Christian, post-liberal, post-modern world. And it seems to me, in a way, it's still trying to fight the battles of modernity and high modernity um, rather than the new ones that we're in right now. So, Well, that is a chastening word, a humbling word, a clarifying <laughs> word, and uh, probably where we need to bring this to a conclusion. But I just want to say thank you for the conversation. And, and again, I want to tell you, you have uh, you've been very much not only on my bookshelves, uh, but in my mind. And uh, as a theologian speaking to a sociologist, I want to thank you for your contribution and, and for your honest engagement on these issues. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, at one point, uh, not too distant future, I'm hoping to write a follow-up to to change the world. Maybe we can come back and talk then too. Well, and uh, maybe we need to uh, have that conversation uh, mind to mind, understanding that that is still one of the rare privileges of our age. And, and as Christians, we, uh, we uh, esteem it as a, as a privilege indeed. It's an uh, Professor James Davison Hunter, thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public.
You're welcome. My pleasure. Many thanks to my guest, Professor James Davison Hunter, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Thinking in Public, you will find more than 200 of these conversations at albertmuller.com under the tab Thinking in Public. For information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, just go to boycecollege.com. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. Until next time, keep thinking. Thinking.